Um. Yeah, so I was going to make this joke about how I'm actually here to talk about the granulars and history of Unshielded Twisted Pear. Um, but uh, that would set the bar low, so anything I do after that should be better. So what we are going to do is uh, start. So the event that we've all came here for, um, got to keep them separated, the words of offspring. Wait, but do we though? Maybe not so much. So let's find out with Taco the Boss. That's me. So first off, just want to do a quick intro. Uh, who is this guy? So who am I? Uh, personal, I do, I actually got my start in software development. I do a lot of software development in my free time and I got into security from pivoting out of security engineering. Uh, I'm recently an ordained priest by the Church of Latter-day Dude for those who follow Dudism. <laughs> It's the uh, non-theist religion of the philosophy of uh, Jeff the Dude Lebowski from The Big Lebowski, the 92 film. Uh, the Coen brothers directed it. Uh, I go to the gym a lot. I like exercising. Um, kind of healthy body, healthy mind sort of thing. I kind of get sluggish mentally and can't work if I don't. So uh, I play a lot of video games, uh, mainly Halo. So if you want to ever like do matchmaking, no scope, uh, pwn some noobs, I'm your dude. So... Also, as a football fan, I kind of feel like I'm going to lose half of you when I tell you uh, what team, but, um, okay. <laughs> All right. More adulation than I thought I'd receive. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the American variety. Sorry, I should have specified. Uh, so professionally, I'm a cybersecurity instructor at the Coder School. And uh, that's me teaching something. I had no hair, now I do. Uh, the Coder School, uh, Learn to Code, Change the World. We basically teach kids um, like eight through 18 how to program, how to really do anything they want to. A lot, a lot of gaming, a lot of Python, a lot of C, Unity, C Sharp. Uh, ubiquitous C Sharp jokes in there. Um, and uh, the Chief Information Officer at RapidCat. And uh, that's probably the most professional you're ever going to see me on camera, captured ever. Uh, so RapidCat, who we are, is uh, we are a financial analytics uh, platform, and we aim to disrupt the Forex binary market by lowering the intellectual barrier to entry so that anybody with a couple brain cells can really do some good work here and tap into the biggest market. The Lead Security Operations Center architect at Black Harbor Cybersecurity and uh, Black Harbor Cybersecurity is a cybersecurity firm based out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we do cybersecurity for automotive OEMs. Uh, we have a, a pretty solid foothold in the cyber to physical space. So everything that um, uh, constitutes a uh, cyber action to a physical reaction, that's what we do. And uh, as a former head of cybersecurity services at SAM Analytics and a former psychological operations specialist in the Army under USASOC, uh, that's me, same guy, just uh, no scarf, um, no hat. So why am I up here speaking to you? So I have experience in uh, red team, so application, mobile, black box testing. Uh, black box, gray box, and light box, but black box in the sense that I'd literally give it a black box and say, hey, do this. Uh, vulnerability assessments in social engineering campaigns against company staffs that paid us to do so with permission, not just out of fun. Uh, blue team side is, uh, so sim development and implementation. Um, I've built a number of systems utilizing the Elastic Stack as the core uh, to create a security incident event management platform. Uh, positions I've held in Security Operations Center, uh, an engineer helping our security team basically decrease their mean time to respond, MTTR and MTTDs, the mean time to detect. Uh, analyst, team lead, and lead architect, which is what I do now. And uh, the server to physical side, uh, I got my start in industrial control systems. So uh, I did a vulnerability assessment and pen test for a, a SCADA network. SCADA is a supervisory control and data acquisition for a major metropolitan public uh, transportation system. Uh, automated transportation, think like street cars, trams, that kind of thing. Uh, I do a lot of research in my free time uh, regarding the realms of industrial control systems and OT. OT means operational technology that is nomenclature vernacular. I'm going to be uh, using a lot in this presentation. Um, 
I also realized that to get all the content into this time block uh, helps to talk fast. So if uh, I lose anyone, please just let me know. I'll try to slow down. Uh, also, automated tank gauges. I recently got that a few months ago. Really interesting. Um, that's something that people don't pay attention to. Not sure why. And what won't I talk about? Um, product promotions. I don't do a lot of product promotions. I talk about products. I try not to because I feel that if I do, that's going to take away from the con the uh, uh, substantial air that I'm trying to get across. I don't want to become too much of a salesman. Uh, the minute granulars of NERC. Oh, crap, hold on. Um, SIP003-5, uh, SIP003-6. I think we get the message. Um, <laughs> These are just uh, different regulatory and compliance bodies that really, if you're going to be doing any kind of ITOT convergence, uh, you should have all of these covered. So I put them in small yellow text um, just to get a couple chuckles, which I did. Thank you. Uh, what will I talk about? So Industry 4.0, uh, what is it, what the problem is? and what the proposed uh, prospective solutions are. And what I mean by that is I have a couple of things I'm going to show that um, it's not a one size fit all, but I do want to try and help get the mentality out there regarding uh, secure architecture for uh, cyber to physical integration between IT systems. And demos, uh, we're going to do a little bit of show dating so you can kind of look yourself uh, if you go home if you want to. So see what some vulnerable nodes look like um, in regards to what I'm going to talk about. We're going to rage against the machine uh, by uh, severely messing up a PLC lab. Um, we're going to do some broker mischief with the MQTT broker. That's going to be the IoT portion. And then we're going to be passing gas tanks, automated tank gauges. Um, so I'm going to build a little bit of historical context to build up from where we were to where we now are in as far as... Uh, Industry 4.0. So late 1700s, the beginning of Industry 1.0, we have the, ex the emergence of mechanization. So we're pivoting our core uh, infrastructure of agriculture, and we are migrating to industry, so creating stuff. And uh, steam engine, um, with the creation of the steam engine, subsequently we have to find ways to extract fuel faster, so we're able to increase the speed of which we can mine coal. Um, and that's, you know, technological introductions and advances, all that stuff. And um, so material, human-driven exchanges, being able to transport uh, people, you know, from going, take a trip from one place to another. Also goods, things that expired, like meat. And uh, so this also created the foundational blueprints of how we uh, have factories and industrial facilities today, in a sense. Industry 2.0. Uh, late 1800s, bless you, um, bless you again. <laughs> I feel like that last one was on a purpose. Um, uh, where was that? Yes, uh, new energy. And um, so uh, gas, oil, electricity, the uh, introduction to the combustion engine, that kind of drove the steel industry to have to increase to create more combustion engines. Uh, new communication, telegraph and tele uh, telephone, these are brown graking communicational uh, achievements that allows, you know, messages to be related from one place to another, obviously. Uh, new transportation, automobile and plane. We have Industry 3.0, uh, so the late 1900s, 1969, so long ago. Um, and uh, we have the introduction of new energy again in the form of nuclear. We have new electronics, so transistors, microprocessors, all that jazz. Um, then we have telecommunications, uh, computers, and we revitalize the industry by the creation of uh, enhancing automation with creation of robots and programmable logic controllers, or PLCs, as the cool kids say. So now, uh, where we are in now is Industry 4.0, right? We have all this crap going on. So the nine pillars of Industry 4.0, as it's uh, known now, First one is a virtual and augmented reality, the idea to generate and create complex digital environments to design and visualize creation of new products, bless you. Uh, additive manufacturing, uh, that's actually really cool, is you're transforming how manufacturing is done. Normally you start off with the source material and you whittle away and you chisel until it becomes something that you want, right? Like molding it really. 
Uh, but this way, using 3D printing of numerous materials, you're actually building from the bottom up. So you're starting with that. And that's really, that's really cool because you don't uh, waste materials. It's pretty exact. Uh, Internet of Things, we all know what IoT is. Does anybody not know what IoT is? Cool. Um, I need present network, everything's connected, peripheral intelligence, uh, tracking behavior for real-time monitoring analysis, uh, big data, so um, you making new standards for data management by repeatable processes that can be you know, integrated into multiple environments, predictive analytics, so statistical algorithms, machine learning, cloud computing, so we all know what that is, uh, advanced simulation, uh, being able to visualize and simulate processes to get the output and then, you know, kind of see what works, what doesn't. There's more to it than that. I'm not doing enough justice. Uh, autonomous robots, they can think, act, and react. And uh, universal integration. So this is a really big one. Communications between different systems. It's kind of a broad one, but it's going to play a part a lot in this presentation. And cybersecurity, because uh, for Industry 4.0 to grow and become something else, you need to have things secure. So if things aren't secure, you can't really expand. Um, so here's the problem as it's seen in the industry, in, as, I, as I see it. We have a large influx of companies and entities that are rushing to meet this industrial relevance, right? So uh, organizations, companies, entities want to meet Industry 4.0, be able to take part in these uh, interconnective exchanges. And with that being said, the creation and development for tools in the realm of uh, cloud management and analytics and all that kind of stuff come about. So here we have uh, connected production. I don't know if that's a company or that's just a tool name, but uh, that's a I, that's an industrial control system uh, dashboard. We have here uh, a home IoT dashboard. It's a little sample. Uh, it's got a light switch and temperature and all that. Um, and then we have a uh, ATG dashboard from Sam IT Solutions, just to be able to look at tank status and all that stuff. And uh, the process kind of goes as follows. Pretty much any meme that you see in here, I sat down and created. So I'm, it might not be that funny, but I hope. Uh, starts off with the organization putting their stuff on the internet. Is this ITOT convergence? Just imagine there's a question mark there. I forgot to add that in. Um, and then that turns into the organization. The organization and the ball is a cybersecurity, right? So the ball's been dropped. Like lots of balls have been dropped by lots of organizations. The ball's been dropped. Um, and then they end up falling flat on their face. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. <laughs> um, so to get into uh, some scary stats, um, I leveraged uh showed in just like 20 minutes to gather uh, some numbers here so i can try and relay um so get it scary movie um ics i would uh, ics ot devices uh there's a few of these a few categories of these that i found so modbus uh plc is utilizing the modbus protocol uh over twenty thousand of those uh, Siemens devices, either S7 uh, PLCs or uh, SCADA uh, devices are over 19,000. Uh, PLCs are devices utilizing the DNP3 protocol is five, over 500. Uh, same thing with Tritium, but it's 35,000. And BACnet, almost 20,000, or 19,000. Uh, G Industrial Solutions, 78. That's actually a little surprising to me because they've been trying to get out there with their Products and uh, devices utilizing the I the IEC 607870-5-104 protocol. That's over 1,100. Uh, these are all just when you're working with uh, PLCs and OT devices, uh, you can have different protocols. But it's just you know like like I showed you with all my pictures in my intro. You know, different hat, same guy, right? Uh, so IoT MQTT brokers. Uh, so MQTT is a protocol that a lot of IoT devices use to communicate, machine-to-machine -machine communication. Uh, so specifically, I believe I did Mosquito. Mosquito, Mosquito and ActiveMQ are the two most uh, prolific and ubiquitous ones out in the wild. But uh, I did MQTTs because it's easier, and I actually see it a lot more. So it's about 79,000, and that's a lot. Um, and automated tank gauges... 
uh, a whopping five grand. But that's still a lot um, for regarding the countries that you can see are filled in red. I forgot what was next. Um, oh, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and do some show dating. Uh, just a couple things. So growing up, uh, my home state of Connecticut, um, didn't really have a lot of television stations to watch because we can never afford cable. So a lot of things I watched were cooking shows. I'm a huge fan of TV magic. So I have some TV magic pre-prepared uh, <laughs> show Dan uh, things set up. Uh, and this, I don't want to get, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in it, but just to show you where to look is how I gather the stats. Um, so uh, there are a, a large amount of uh, protocols that are utilized, and, and we can see here. Um, so as long as we don't do anything after just looking at the Shodan information, we're good. Uh, so he currently overloaded. I guess that answers the question here. Um, OK. That is odd. So if I can't load this, oh, there we go. Yeah, sweet. Um, so let's take a look nearby to where we are, see if there's anything in either Chapel Hill, Durham, or Raleigh that is openly exposed. It should just take me a few minutes, um, and maybe like one. Uh, let's see where we are. OK. Um, that's nowhere. Um, uh, I don't know what that is. Um, a better idea to make this more streamlined is I'm actually just going to go back and uh, we're going to take a quick look at the output of what we have. That way I don't kill time. I can't go back. It's, yeah, I've gone too, gone too far. I'm in too deep, man. Um, We'll come back to that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so uh, port 1883 is normally what MQTT uses, but there's also a couple other things that use that. So I had to parse with the string of MQTT in the output. And so we can see right here, uh, whatever this is in Yulong, Hong Kong, uh, this is most likely an IoT broker utilizing is probably mosquito because one thing I've noticed too while doing research is uh, a lot of the mosquito brokers uh, they, these are called topics so these are like think of them almost like directories for a command so a uh, broker clients maximum a control command might be control you know give it a, a integer it might increase the maximum something like that um, I'm not an IoT expert, but I understand enough of uh, MQTT to know how to leverage it in a uh, not so good manner for professional purposes only. And um, uh, so this is most likely a mosquito broker because they normally begin with this uh, dollar sign sys. I someone can correct me later on if I'm wrong because I'm not always right, but most of the time I am. Uh, so here we go. Uh, active MQ, you can see it begins with the active MQ string. That's how you know it's an active MQ device. Then you have your different topics after here. Um, not going to get too much into that because I've got a lot more to cover. But uh, yeah, so gas tanks. Um, let's go ahead and see gas stations near us that are openly. Uh, I really hope this works. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to um, go on to the next thing. Uh, so let's go ahead. We see a gas station in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so view the details of it, and we can see. Uh, actually, hey, that's in Durham. Uh, we can see there's a gas station on 200 James Street. So the thing about uh, trying to uh, identify cyber physical devices, um, it's interesting, right? Because normally. Uh, you can have a company in New York and their web server is coming out of California or maybe they have a couple other ones just to meet like geographic demands or whatever. With cyber to physical devices, you're actually getting the IP of when that leaves uh, the network. So you're getting, uh, if it's in, so it's located in Durham, but we saw the uh, we saw where it was um, uh, geographically with the lat launch, whatever Shodan uses. Um, we saw that in Raleigh. So whenever that 
that last hop that goes to the open internet after it leaves whatever ISP boundaries. That's where we see it at. So it's a not super far away radius. But anyways, uh, what we can see here is uh, this is an automated tank gauge that is open on the internet, probably so that some company has an ATG manager that you can log into and view all this information. Uh, essentially what this is, uh, Vida Root is a automated tank gauge um, uh, that is prolifically used in a lot of places. And when people want to do remote managing of it, they open the port 10001 and it's essentially a, a telnet engagement from there. So if you can tell that you can break into ATGs. Now, granted, you do have users and passwords, um, but there are some ways to uh, get around it. Um, uh, I mean, you can try DOSing the 10001 port and then keep trying to log into it while it boots up. Because uh, I think the pass, I think the password, uh, the user authentication, whatever's in it, I think runs last, something like that. That's some, something I came across during research. I never tried it because the whole legality thing but um so yeah <laughs> uh yeah that that old bugger uh so what i'm gonna do here is i have uh i created a tool uh, called rapid fire when I did my first uh, industrial control, that's the wrong one. Hold on. Uh, I'll just do it from here, whatever. Um, give me just a second, guys. That's, that's not a command. Okay, so I created a tool called Rapid Fire. Uh, I created it um, because I needed a way to quickly test the ability to do holding register address value injection and basically be able to flip bits and coils on a, a programmable logic controller. So uh, I decided that because like a lot of the socket based tools out there like MBT get, um, you can only do them one at a time. Uh, and PLCs also have, a lot of them have a limit, especially if they're using the Modbus protocol, that um, they can only handle about 124, 125 um, requests at once. So I have a, I hope I put it on, uh, <laughs> I have a demo uh, set up, a demo PLC. And what we're going to do really quickly, um, I do have one more thing I have to open up, which... Um, was a bit of an oversight, but I'm actually making it in really good time comparatively to, from what I thought. So, um, okay. I'm going to go back to here. Go back in here. So what I'm going to do is really quickly just show you uh, when we query the PLC and ask it what it what it has in it. Um, I can show you what that output looks like. If I I'm okay. Um, give me just a second. Okay, so right here we see, uh, if we've got a watch command that is going to run an MBT get query uh, to our demo instance. So right now we can see these are holding register address values. Honestly, from the outside in, we have no idea what these mean. Uh, these could be temperature settings. These could be, uh, I don't know, the weight of something, right? These numbers look arbitrary, but, you know, believe me, they're not. They're, they mean something to that particular device. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and can I split? Eh, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and split this. Split it with that. And then I'm also going to go right here, do the same thing. Um, so we're going to have this kind of on the side so we can go back to it after we do the exploits so I can show you what that looks like. Um, and All right, so here's an, another uh, MBT 
uh, get watch that's going to look at the coils, so just zeros and ones, right? Zeros and ones. Um, that's the the result of whatever ladder logic that you assign to that particular PLC for the functions that it oversees. Um, it would be like me to just lose where I was. Here we go. Okay. So we've all seen um, what that output is there for watching the holding register address values and the coils. So now we're going to get into Modbus uh, module. And uh, we're going to use the SMOD framework. Um, nope. Yeah, so there's uh, some bugs in here uh, where the, it doesn't go right back to the menu. So you're going to see me control seeing a lot. Um, that's supposed to say stuff doer because um, I use it to do stuff. So we're gonna we're gonna use um, what is going on? Mm, Seem to have ran into something odd. Give me just one second. If not, I have a video, so. <laughs> So when doing this, you should plug in your laptop. Heard it from me yeah. first. Plug in my virtual laptop. Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad I had a backup there. Um, so I do want, I do need to keep this on though at some point, but we can go through the video. Uh, video is probably a bit more entertaining, I think, anyways, than watching me just uh, plug around with shit. So, while the video's going, I will explain what's going on to the best of my ability, and then... I will go from there. So, um, I do have the video, just in case uh, stuff gets kind of swifty, which it has. So, uh, here we go. The functional version of what I was going to show you. Uh, so, rapid fire, um, getting in, uh, getting into stuff doer. See, it shows up nicer there. Um, and what I just did was I, I, I pulled a show modules, which in SMOD, SMOD is a, a Modbus testing framework uh, that I built a wrapper in RapidFire for. It wasn't originally part of RapidFire. RapidFire was just for holding register address values, nothing else, and I just kind of kept building on it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the uh, module Modbus scanner UID. This is harder to see than I thought. Um, I do apologize if no one can see it, but um, so we what we just did was we set the uh, set the target host to zero. We want to get the UID of the PLC. That way we can figure out the functions. So we see the UID is one. Um, there's two. Uh, just go with one. Now I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, use the show uh, functions or get function module. And then we set show the options. We're going to set the R hosts again, and then we're going to take the UID that we just got and we're going to put that in there as well. This, is, I mean, if you work in Metasploit or anything, this framework looks familiar how to how to use it. Um, okay, it takes a second for these to come up, but so uh, we see that function three is enabled to read multiple holding registers, and I'm highlighting on the top right side utilizing a terminal split watch window. Uh, we can see the different holding and register address values there, and then function code read write multiple registers. That should foreshadow some things, I hope. And uh, give it a second, it stops. Um, eventually, I stop it. Function code one is supported, which means that's on, which means we have the ability to read from an external location the you know bits in this coil. And then uh, function code 15 is being able to write multiple coils. Some more foreshadowing there. So then we're going to get back into the Modbus module. We're going to use uh, number three, which is a holding register address value injection. 
and uh, saying the target IP address. What we're doing here is um, messing it up. <laughs> uh, I forgot it. I don't know why I didn't just cut that out. Um, so we're doing the same thing again, uh, putting in the you know home. Now uh, again, we have um, the holding register. Sorry, the um, uh, PLC can only handle a certain amount of communications at a time, so that's where we're setting a start and end uh, an address. I just put one through twenty-one because you can see relatively okay the one through twenty in the top right. And the value we're going to inject for test is seven seven seven. So um, pay attention to the top right numbers. And so we have just um, quashed or ruined all the configurations of that exposed PLC. So somebody is going to get fired. We're going to do the same thing with uh, coil injection. So uh, it's the same, same shebang, just with the bottom right. I'm going to get in here real quick. So glad I took this video. Uh, all right, so the next thing that we're going to be doing is uh, if this turns on in time, I'm probably just going to migrate back to the thing so I can explain and highlight things. Actually, no, 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 I, I have it in here. So pretty much what we just did, um, what we just did here was uh, we enter the MQTT target, and uh, what happens is that broker that we target, uh, we're saying, hey, give me all your topics. Um, so these are all the topics, uh, like I showed you before. Why did that just go back? So we have all these topics here, and we see one called sensor. Uh, sensors, uh, sensors hyphen sen uh, sens sensor slash sensor hyphen three five four two, and we see it has the message of off. I'm not sure we can do with that, but um, I guess we can find out. And highlight this three more times. <laughs> And um, uh, it is a little bit choppy. Um, you end up having to re-enter the MQTT target address again for that broker. And so the client that we want, sorry, the sensor, the topic that we want to subscribe to is sensors slash sensors hyphen 3542, the thing that we saw that was off up here. And now that we subscribe to it, uh, we are um, choosing the publish topic, which by default can be control unless you change it. And so now we've subscribed to the target of this sensor that has a binary on-off function. I wonder what that can be. Uh, then we have subscribed to the publishing topic, which allows us to actually publish things to it. And we're going to go ahead and publish in uh, something. There we go. On. So we're literally just publishing the string on to it. And I have to go back into it, redo the querying, and then uh, give it a second. You can see right here, sensors slash sensor dash 3542. At the very bottom, the message is now on. So someone's light just turned on. <laughs> now, it's a um, simple example, but the fact of the matter is that there are smart homes with sensors that tell you if your doors are opened or closed. If I'm going to break into your home, um, I don't know if most people do this, but you could just see this out in the open, uh, change the option from uh, closed to open. So if somebody's at work, they think their doors are closed, but they're really open, but you're just uh, giving the smart home that message. Um, yeah. So that's that. Um, Next up, we're going to, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is where we're going to do the, the 
automated tank gauges. So the automated tank gauge, creating a, a fake one is, sorry, creating a sample one is really difficult. So I went with a gas pot. Uh, gas pot that pie is really awesome. Um, so you can build functionality into it, but um, I spent too much time with the meme, so. And so what happens is uh, when you enter uh, the IP address, it will then, I kind of have like a little instruction thing in here telling you what you can and can't do. It's basically printing out the, the uh, uh, it's the vendor docs really, the controls of the vendor docs of the automated tank gauge vendor uh, has online. So you can see here, uh, we start all commands utilizing a break A and then an open square bracket. Um, and then any three numbers after that is a command code and the zero zero, I have no idea. It's just something that's gotta be, you know, at the end of that. So we're gonna go ahead and, uh, we're gonna eventually get into it. Um, th there's a, a restart. Um, uh, a restart command that I end up just showing. Uh, so you can see here, I ended up messing that one up. Uh, so you can see there's a caret A. Now I'm, I'm actually missing the I. There's supposed to be an I right after it, but um, you'll see that work in a second here. And then 201 is just a list inventory. So 20100, uh, you're just looking at the 201. So uh, any other command uh, with the uh, honeypot, unfortunately, does not work. It will just give that 9999 uh, Fox Fox 1 Bravo output. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the demo. Um, I forgot how to work PowerPoint. All right, so next, the air gap. This is where the... Uh, you know, we got to keep them separated. In the words of uh, Offspring, was actually a pioneer in the industrial control system field. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm, that's not true. Mm. So, pictorial GIF representations of the air gap. Take a second, soak all this in. Gap, house pushing, cutting cables. This deer, I should have got one of the deer falling, but, or whatever that is, gazelle or something, but, um, just to kind of drive the point home, but forgive me, um, committing meme, uh, failure. So the typical traditional, uh, mindset of the industrial control system admin is keep your OT, keep your operational technology off the interwebs. Don't do it for any reason. Industrial relevance, psh, don't, don't do it. But that's not sustainable, you dingus. <laughs> if you want to be relevant, you have to um, end up playing nice with IT. And that's what it comes down to with cyber physical security is learning how to integrate securely. So you can't just sequester yourself off into a cubby hole because um, then you get stagnant and you're not able to grow. So how do we securely bridge the air gap? What I'm going to be getting into here is uh, something that I have presented before um, at another conference. It's regarding uh, secure architecture in an industrial control system or OT environment. But the idea being that what you see here can actually be kind of, you know, remolded or customized for another. So like this industrial control system, you might be able to come up with a way to adapt and pivot this to uh, an IoT setup or something like that, right? So that's the idea. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm uh, just being a one, you know, view here. Uh, so let's get into some fun dementals. Uh, we have cybersecurity rule number one. Uh, you're not secure. No matter what, you've got to always keep that mindset. And uh, here we have a guy poking needle holes into a water bottle. Um, it just seemed right to use at the time. And um, here we have Rocco Bodie of Mega64 hacking everything in Best Buy. 
stock went down next day. Um, <laughs> so, and just to really drive the point home that you need to keep this in your mind, that whatever you're doing always come from the, the area, the mindset that you're not secure. And that's something I don't have to tell you guys. Um, but I do have this very slow moving, growing text that will give you time to reflect. So this is my drink break. All right. That's, that's enough. It, it gets rather big, takes up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, here is um, the sliding scale of security. This is um, used in the SANS Industrial Control System and OT security course. Um, starting from securing uh, the architecture and then getting into passive defense and from there. You, you've all probably seen this, but I'm more just kind of context building so that those of you who might not understand ICS security can hopefully look at this and realize that there's um, kind of draw some relevance to the following slides because I, I didn't want to lose anybody so I feel that was a good thing to do. So how do we properly secure the air gap? Uh, you have your compulsory methods uh, employing proper encryption to cyber physical network setup. So obviously the IoT uh, MQTT broker mosquito that we got into proper encryption wasn't set up. Our AAA was in the toilet uh, authentication authorization auditing. Um, nothing was done with that or else we wouldn't be able to get into it. Notionally speaking, obviously, it's just a little lab on my laptop, but um, routine vulnerability checks, uh, being able to check for vulnerabilities on a pretty quick iteration, uh, iterative basis, and uh, performing vulnerability management from there. And deploying active monitoring, so a SIM, a SOC, some way of being alerted. Um, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the um, industry uh, regulations do require, regulations and compliances have some tenant in there that requires a monitoring of logs and activity, right? It just, it's kind of like how HIPAA has it, PCI has it, FERPA has it, Nick also has it. Um, not Nick, Nurk, sorry. Um, so, continued, um, how do we secure the network architecture? So, through architecture it's a bit redundant I could have gotten rid of that subtext there and um, so uh, quick time check I'm gonna be going through these pretty quickly um, for this example this green box right here is going to represent a, uh, a SCADA device which is a, a supervisory control and data acquisition device that's uh, in charge of monitoring manager uh, and managing different PLCs and this cloud logo right here is going to be the uh, remote magical analytics thing, right? So uh, this is how a simple architecture can look. You've got your you've got your control points and monitor points. You've got your PLCs, which uh, hold domain over that, and you have your SCADA uh, or MTU, which will hold domain over those PLCs. So you can obviously pick up that there's a, a certain semblance of hierarchy here in cyber physical and ICSOT networks. So we do a little bit of threat modeling uh, at a very simple, easy level. So what are we building? Architecture, I just showed you. Uh, what can go wrong? Uh, just assume that everything's gonna go wrong when you're doing your threat modeling. Uh, so incoming communications of any kind can compromise a SCADA or PLC that's exposed only because uh, they are so rigid in the ways that they are built that if you give it anything it's not expect expecting, it's not good. Um, and so here we have this, this uh, blue dash line representing the area uh, of trust here. So going out, we can trust that, but coming in, we can't. So uh, what are we going to do about it? We want to protect the SCADA network from un unsolicited incoming traffic. And how we do that is, um, yeah, don't do this. Don't just connect your device to the internet. I forgot about that. Um, don't do that. Um, so here we go. We, the purple dash line will now represent the trust barrier in this particular diagram. Uh, we see here the addition of a bright blue, almost cyan box. What this is, uh, 
it's a data diode or a unidirectional gateway. Only a few companies actually make these. The idea is that you have a one-way outgoing data diode that lets traffic go out, but you can't come in. So, uh, did we do a good job enough? So, test. Uh, did we do a good enough job? I can't English right now. Uh, so, test it, right? So, try and get somebody on the outside to just send crap to it. Uh, arbitrary or uh, valid traffic. So now I'm going to get into, these are the prospective proposed solutions, which again will not work in every environment, but the idea is to think securely. So I'm going to give you my ideas. Uh, so here we have SCADA Cloud Analytics, which is sitting in the cloud somewhere. We've got our uh, switch right here with our two different networks. So we have, uh, we have a, a specific segmented network just for the OT, then the IT, com you know, um, component of the organization. And a simple way of looking at it is if you really want to do that without having traffic come in, these are examples without using a unidirectional gateway, by the way, because unidirectional gateways are really expensive and it's also not a perfect solution because you can also, there are reasons that you'd have to do uh, updates to whatever's on the OT network or you'd have somebody on the outside that has to do some kind of maintenance, right? So you, you there's a uh, configurational something that you can actually allow it to uh, accept traffic at certain times, right? But the idea is it's always supposed to be off. So, um, so what we do is we have a relay server from the OT network to the IT network. Uh, then we have another another high level model here. We have a relay server with a one way VPN connection from the OT network to an independently segmented network that is also separate from the IT component. And then that goes out. But now we're going to get to the granules of it. How are we doing this? Uh, we're sending the one way VPN connection over a network trunk. Uh, network trunk, for those who don't know, uh, is basically a configuration on the switch or network device basically saying that, hey, this IP from this subnet can talk to this IP from this other subnet, but nothing else. So this is kind of like the, I got a little bit happy with this here, but um, we're going with that, with that second high level network. Uh, we have the OT network. We have the uh, segmented network right here. Then we have the IT network. And so what we have here is, uh, so let's say that this, this whole setup right here is just kind of hanging to the left of this relay server, right? So we have the three different subnets for the three different networks. We have 192.168.30-24, then we have uh, 192.168.4.0, 192.168.5.0, right? So let's say this is the arbitrary. I just picked IP addresses. We have 192.168.3.90 is a relay server on the OT network, and it's reutilizing a network trunk to pass the one-way VPN server uh, connection from the... Uh, this is for monitoring and analytics, by the way, sending it up to the cloud. We're sending it to a recipient uh, a relay server, which will then send it through a reverse proxy to go out to the internet. The idea behind the reverse proxy is that once you put something on the internet, it can be seen, ideally. Uh, and so if something tries to hit that, we can have uh, basically reroute to a honeypot would be the idea. Um, I haven't tried it myself, but theoretically I find this to be a functional thing. Um, and then the honeypot will also... So we have this uh, NID server right here, which is pro probably just running Suricata or something, and then we can also forward honeypot logs to find out what's going on, that we were feeding all this intelligence into this, and we can realize that, hey, there are these people trying to get into our device, right? So uh, we have the tap, the tap span port uh, right here, this pink one, and uh, that's feeding all the network traffic in, while also simultaneously ingesting... Uh, logs from the honeypot server and we're utilizing syslog ng as a forwarder on this uh, this right here which is the outgoing port yeah so um, not a perfect model but if you want to get an idea of just some creative ways to do it I think this suits uh, well Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, go through a quick uh, scenario where we have an industrial control system set up 
Uh, we have, this is our SCADA communication. So the, this is the traffic going from the PLC uh, to the SCADA device itself. Uh, we have no visibility from here to the interdirectional gateway. We have no visibility from the interdirectional gateway to any other layers, if you have any. And uh, then we have a monitoring platform right here. So really, uh, vendors will say, hey, you can monitor your SCADA events, use this, plug this up, whatever. We have an employee. He's, he's kind of a disgruntled employee, right? Like he's been asking for a raise for like a year now, and he keeps saying no. Um, text is too much. Checks personal emails, takes phone calls. Um, so he kind of gets ticked off and becomes a criminal. And so what he does, he has direct physical access to the SCADA device and he goes to, he plugs in a uh, thumb drive and flips it around, um, basically turning it into something that it shouldn't be, right? Uh, in this case, it talks to a remote server which then installs, so, so notionally for this, the, uh, the attacker has also done something to the unidirectional gateway that allows it to then uh, accept incoming traffic. So the remote server can do something to that, that SCADA device. And now uh, this guy has a, I don't know, Bitcoin miner, right? <laughs> so we had this powerful SCADA device that's just sitting there mining Bitcoin for him. It's just one example. It's contrived. Um, but... So try and get visibility in those areas. Uh, we're reaching towards the end of this. So uh, then monitoring. So we've all seen this hackers movie is real cool. All that stuff. Um, the matrix is just really tropey pictures. I wanted to put up. Uh, so yeah, don't be scared. Be secured for those of you who watch from practical jokers. I've got credit here. Uh, all the industrial control system research has been done by myself. Um, that's me at the North Carolina Modern Art Museum looking at a dangly shit man. Um, and uh, in regards to, to the uh, IoT MQTT, um, I don't know this guy, but he has uh, stevesinternetguide.com and is really good if you're trying to get into uh, IoT stuff. So. Uh, thank you, Steve, wherever you are. I think he's in the UK, actually. He's just um, hosting providers from there. And uh, as far as the automated tank generations concerned, um, Eric Zhang, otherwise known as Eric Zhang. Um, he has a uh, handle that I forgot to put in here. Sorry. Um, he wrote an article that got me into automated tank generate, uh, gauges. Um, he was one of the first dudes that exposed it. A lot of people came after him with it, but... Um, oh, yeah, so I wanted to wish you all a uh, early early holidays here. Um, because everybody gets rapid fire. I have everything set to push to Bitbucket. Um, we'll just see if it doesn't crap out on me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just going to go back here, sorry. Um, okay, so um, let me... Oh, yeah, I got a CD into it that helps things. Fingers crossed, okay. That's good. Um, commit, and, and then. Okay, so that's good. Um, shit, uh, uh, 
it's one of the few things that have seemingly worked. Wait, I'm not going to talk too soon. Okay, there we go. So we have, if I refresh this right here, should be able to see it. Oh, golly gee, there we go. All right. So, yeah, I. this isn't just me being nice. I actually need help with, with this. So. <laughs> Yeah, so, oh yeah, bonuses, yeah, so um, uh, the Bitbucket repo, that's it. Take a second, take the the, the picture. Um, I'm pushing it, we're pretty much done. Uh, it's my email, so go ahead and email me if you wanna uh, be someone to work on rapid fire. Uh, Twitter me, talk with the boss, Instagram, talk with the boss. Um, and uh, it's really just a bunch of like Star Trek, Deep Space Nine pictures I put on there, so. Um, now, yeah, cool. Odd uh, question questions. Oh, uh, yes, you. So there are, from what I've seen, uh, choice number two. Um, you can make a software-based one. But the idea is that having the physical one would, you'd have to do stuff to it to make it. There are pretty cool hands off there. Okay. They're, uh, they're, they're one way fiber nicks. So you have a card that's only capable of sending and a card that's only capable of receiving. So with that, do you, are you limited to only using graphics? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because there's no way for it to talk back. Should have had you up here, man. <laughs> All right. Does uh, anybody else have any? You got my email, right? Okay, good. All right. Cool. We'll talk. <laughs> uh, is that a hand up? I can't. No? Okay. There was a glare. I couldn't tell if that was a hand up. Uh, cool. All right. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.